An elderly woman has been brutally murdered. I've never personally had a crime scene where someone's been attacked that viciously on the face. This is a particularly ferocious attack. And when further attacks happen... I have never seen so much blood at a crime scene. It still affects me today talking about it. This was by far the worst series of offences that took place in my lifetime. Investigators are under pressure. You know, you look for clues to who the offender might be. We didn't have any, and there was no evidence. To catch the predator. There was fear stalking the streets. Who knows where this fella's going to strike? Before it's too late. It's just after 1 a.m. A member of the public has discovered the body of an elderly woman in an alleyway in Rochdale. This is a particularly ferocious attack. It stands out for me, but it's something I came across very rarely. DCI Michael Freeman is tasked with leading what is swiftly deemed a murder inquiry. She had been strangled with a pair of her tights, which were covered in blood. It was clear that she had been stamped on, on her face. Um, you could see the bruising, you could see an indentation. The worst thing was, was the facial injuries, really. She had been robbed as well, uh, because it lost the rings off her finger. The scene was still in place when I went there, and yet yeah, it was you know, first impressions, it was quite horrific, really. Detective Inspector Martin Jeffs is one of the officers assigned to the case. We immediately call our forensic team, our scenes of crime officers, and the first thing we do would cordon it off so that nobody could go into that crime scene or anywhere around it. Over a career spanning three decades, forensic trainer Sarah Thurkle has investigated more than 500 deaths. I've never personally had a, a crime scene where someone's been attacked that viciously on the face. The female victim had no underwear on. There was obvious signs of a sexual assault. The alleyway is secured and forensics move in to harvest evidence. It's dark, you've got time pressures on you, you've got weather pressures on you. Not only do you have to consider the alleyway where the body's been found, but also how that body might have got to that location. So you need to consider the whole alleyway and beyond. You might be looking for discarded items, blood staining, which is all really difficult to search for outside in the dark on a September night. CSIs sweep the scene, hunting for DNA and any other physical traces of the killer. The last person to have touched or had any contact with that deceased was the offender. Hence, any fibres or any DNA may have dropped on the victim as they've fallen onto the floor. You can actually fibre tape the body in situ before the body's moved. So by doing this, you cover the deceased in small pieces of effectively sellotape to recover any trace evidence from the surface and your evidence is preserved in there for as long as you want it to be preserved. CSIs recover the blood-soaked tights from around the victim's neck. They appear to have been used as a ligature to strangle her. If the tights have been tied around her neck and tied as a knot, then there may well be DNA on that knot from the offender. 
hoping to obtain a DNA profile of the killer. The tights are fast-tracked to the lab for testing. The victim's family has reported her missing and police are able to identify the 65-year-old as local resident Eileen Yavchak. Eileen was a retired school teacher. He used to teach at my daughter's school, in fact. Alistair Webster is a Rochdale born and bred prosecution barrister. This was by far the worst crime that, that took place in my lifetime. She had uh, four children. She was married to her husband, John. And in the community, they were well known. Eileen was a bit of a character. She was hard of hearing, um, but she disobeyed instructions to wear a hearing aid because she was too proud to do so. She was an avid quiz person. She loved the pub quizzes. And that's why she was in the, the Weaver's Arms that night. Less than 100 yards from her home, the Weaver's Arms was Eileen's local and the last place she was seen alive. Ironically, um, she was usually watched over by someone from the pub who watched her walk out of the Weaver's Arms, cross the road, and then carry on down the street and she was at her home address. And on that particular night that she was murdered, I do know that that person that normally looked out for her was not there. Michael and his team begin to hypothesize who may be responsible for the attack. The fact that this happened so close to Eileen's home, when she was usually looked out for, could suggest that her attacker was familiar with her routine or had been watching her for some period of time. His use of the alleyway seems to indicate that he knows the geography of the area, so we might be looking for somebody local. We were looking for a suspect, in this case, who would have been, I suppose, young and fit enough to have committed the horrific injuries. Other than that, we didn't have any profile of the killer. The fact that Eileen was robbed and sexually assaulted makes profiling the suspect even harder. Expressive crimes such as violence don't usually occur in combination with acquisitive crimes. Acquisitive crimes are when something is taken during the crime, for example, a robbery or a theft. Expressive crimes are crimes of emotion or passion, for example, violence or sexual assault. The fact that she was robbed could also point towards an opportunist attack where the robbery escalated towards the sexual violence. Knowing that Eileen's killer could potentially be known to her, police must eliminate her family and friends as suspects. We look at whether her husband could have been responsible or other members of the family, and you have to ask some difficult questions to alibi them out. It was done extremely sensitively because, I mean, for, for a minute, I, because of the level of ferociousness of the attack, I didn't believe any family member could have done that. But if you don't ask those questions, you leave yourself wide open to criticism. At the lab, scientists examining the fibre tapings have made a discovery. There are some unusual red fibres on the tapes. These potentially were from a fleece. So from a forensic strategy point of view, any future searches or future suspects that came to light, there would need to be a, a search for any red fleece jumpers or jackets or anything that was red in colour. While it's a significant find, it doesn't give the investigators the breakthrough they're looking for. Obviously, there will be contamination on the victim at all stages of their life. So not only just at the point of the assault, but also there'll be contamination on them from people she'd met at the pub or from her husband's clothing or any other items of her clothing that she was wearing. So from a forensic strategy perspective, it's quite difficult to say that those red fibres are from the offender. Several hours after the discovery of her body, CSIs have completed taking samples from Eileen in situ. Her body is taken to the mortuary for a post-mortem examination. I realised the extent of how ferocious the attack had been when I attended the post-mortem. The pathologist was able to tell us that the, the mark on her cheek was caused at or around the, the time of her death. So we knew that that mark was caused by the killer. The pathologist confirms the cause of death to be strangulation using Eileen's tights. The last moments of Eileen's life must have been absolutely horrendous, 
horrific. I, I can't even imagine it. She was still alive when she was stamped on the face. I can only try to imagine what she was going through at that time. The forensic lab returns the swab results taken from the tights. The female had so many serious head injuries that the tights were covered in blood because they were so blood soaked in the victim's DNA. The forensic scientist wasn't able to get any other DNA profile on these tights. When it came back negative, it was frustrating. It was very frustrating. We had no physical DNA evidence at all, and we had no other forensic evidence. The pressure was on from day one because, of course, the press were interested. And, you know, the, the press play an important part for us in murder inquiries because they get information out there. Everyone in the Rochdale area was horrified um, when we found out that this, this lady who'd never harmed anyone in her life and only done well for the community had been murdered in that way. We really were stuck as to who might be responsible for this murder. We hadn't got a clue. With an unknown killer on the loose, police fear it's only a matter of time before he strikes again. The body of 65-year-old Eileen Yavchak has been discovered in a darkened alley in Rochdale. She's been sexually assaulted and strangled with her own tights, but forensics have been unable to raise any foreign DNA profiles. There is a distinctive stamp mark on her face and red fibers were retrieved from her body. Having eliminated everyone known to her as suspects, detectives do not have a single lead. We suspected it would be someone local, but there was no evidence. Two weeks after Eileen's brutal murder, news of another local attack reaches DCI Michael Freeman. It's about half past six on a Saturday morning, and a very anxious inspector said, look, we've had a really, really bad rape in uh, Barron Street in the town centre overnight. I said, right, I'll go down to the scene. Barron Street in central Rochdale is a secluded street, surrounded by boarded up buildings, less than a mile from Eileen's home. I have never seen so much blood at a crime scene and someone survive. She was attacked, she was raped, and she was cut with a craft knife, to the extent that when she managed to stagger away from the scene after the offender had left, she stumbled out onto the main thoroughfare and one of the witnesses described her as a lady in a red dress. Uh, she was actually naked and the red dress was the blood pouring from her face. It was a warm September morning and to tell you how much blood was there, that crime scene was absolutely covered in flies by 10 o'clock in the morning. It still affects me today talking about it. She was locked out of the house and should have been at home quite safe, but she was trying to find somewhere to go. So she was just out by chance, by mischance. She had done nothing to invite what happened. Just was the wrong place, the wrong time when a dangerous person was there. The area is secured and cordoned off, and the CSIs move in. So an alleyway in a town centre is potentially going to have lots of items of rubbish in there, potential footprints, potential dropped cigarette ends, dropped crisp packets, which may or may not be relevant to the incident. Our role is to collect anything that we think might be relevant, that looks like it's out of place or looks like it's been dropped recently. They soon make a major discovery. A bloodied handprint was found on a railing down the alleyway. The handprint obviously may well be her handprint, but also it could be the handprint of the offender. So the handprint would be photographed in situ in order to record any ridge detail. It would also be swabbed for DNA. Not only do you want to try and identify whose palm print or handprint that is, but you also want to identify whose blood is it. If you can get the offender's palm print or handprint in the victim's blood, then that's really good evidence. 
I'm thinking, well, you know, we've really got something here. Uh, OK, it's a palm print, but it's, it's evidence. CSIs make a second significant discovery at the crime scene. There was some footwear marks found, so a CSI is a collector of evidence at the scene. They'll see the footwear mark, they'll take photographs, they'll cast it, and they'll, that will be retained as an exhibit. The footprint cast is analysed at the lab. The detectives hope to determine the size and type of shoe to potentially link it to an offender for the rape as well as to Eileen's murder. Obviously, it's a public area, so there could be footprints from any members of the public that have been down there, and it could be a footprint from an offender. In her police interview, the Barron Street victim details something significant her attacker said during the ordeal. She told a story that the attacker was saying to her, don't look at me, don't look at me. If you look at me, I'll, I'll slash you, I've done worse than this. This could be for the simple reason that he doesn't want to be identified, but it could also suggest some element of guilt or shame for the act that he's carrying out. The local press reported that, you know, that there was fear stalking the streets. And who knows where this fella's going to strike? It wasn't as though he was attacking people he knew, it was just total strangers. The press speculates that the same person is responsible for the rape and Eileen's murder and label the suspect as the Rochdale Ripper. It had a huge impact on the community, particularly on females. There was a noticeable difference in females' behaviour in terms of when they went into town, they went in groups. So there was a genuine fear that there was a madman out there. Serial crimes taking place in a local community in this way could lead to a hostile community atmosphere. This might include suspicion, mistrust of neighbours, and women being fearful of men. Amidst the media frenzy, people start coming forward. A few names started to get thrown at us by members of the public, uh, which were all looked at, which came to nothing. It's common for many people to come forward to the police with information that they think might be relevant, but it's common for that information to lead to nothing. The investigation team for the Barron Street attack received some important news about the footprint found at the crime scene. It matches a size 10 Nike trainer. CSI will be able to say, well, I'm happy that that pattern on that sole of that shoe that I found at the crime scene is a Nike Air Force trainer because all Nike Air Force trainers have that same sole. While it's a valuable lead, it doesn't help investigators to get closer to the attacker. What CSI can't say is what colour the trainer was and who was wearing that trainer. The actual importance of a footwear mark is actually the unique detail. So the damage on the soles, the feathering caused by the manufacturing process and any wear on that sole of that shoe is what a forensic scientist is looking at. So that will be retained ready for a potential offender shoe that might be recovered. Police have a handprint and a shoe print, but no way to track down their owner. Desperate for a new lead, forensic scientists trawl through the case files of serious assaults within the area. When a forensic scientist is sent exhibits from a scene, they would also be sent witness statements, a victim statements, and a full MO or modus operandi. They identify a recent attack that bears a striking similarity to the Barron Street attack. About 7.30 or 6.30 a.m. in the morning, there is a, a lady who's approached by somebody who appeared to be a jogger, who's come up behind her, he's raped her, he's had a bottle in his hand, and, he's, uh, and he's, then he's taken the bra off her, tied her wrist together, and said, count to 200, don't look at me, don't look at me, and he's gone. During both attacks, the offender told his victims not to look at them and threatened to cut them if they did. Also, instructing victims to count before he could escape indicates that there was an element of planning involved and it might have been planned from beginning to end. You can't immediately say it's the same person, but it, I think you begin to think, hang on a minute, you know, there's some similarities here. Again, this was an item of clothing that was used, similar to Eileen's murder, where her tights were tied around her neck. I would be thinking about what 
trace evidence might be on this bra. The offenders obviously had to touch and handle this item of clothing in order to be able to tie it. If this is a rape case, is there any seminal fluid that's been on his hands that might also have transferred onto the bra? Screening for semen is called acid phosphatase testing. The item is sprayed with water to dampen it and then blotting paper is applied um, to the surface of the, of the item. If the blotting paper in certain areas changes colour, then a forensic scientist is able to target those areas to be able to try and extract seminal fluid and then be able to DNA profile that. Rochdale police strongly suspect that the three attacks that have taken place in the space of the last few months are linked. Two of the women were told not to look at their attacker. The chance of two attackers attacking women in the same area, robbing them and sexually assaulting them, is vanishingly remote. But they need forensic evidence to prove their hypothesis before the predator commits yet another violent crime. We now know of two brutal rapes, and there could be others that haven't been reported. The suspect is showing signs of an appetite for this kind of violent crime, and it's reasonable to assume that he may continue offending until he's caught. We put out at that time warnings to lone females not to go out on your own, not to walk after dark, that kind of thing. Actually, the message that we were putting out was don't go out alone. The fact that the community is understandably worried and fearful could give the offender a sense of excitement and a feeling of power and control. The media coverage intensifies every day the killer is on the loose. There's a lot of pressure on the investigations team and the CSI to be able to find the evidence. And then obviously a forensic scientist would take several days or months to examine the actual evidence. But quite often, if there's a high profile case, it puts a, a lot of pressure on the forensic teams to be able to get results. Finally, the police get a much needed breakthrough from the seminal fluid found on the bra from the canal towpath attack. There was actually semen on the bra and they were able to get a full profile which was loaded to the DNA database. This full profile came back as a hit. The DNA resulted in identifying somebody called Michael Hardacre as responsible for that rape. Michael Hardacre was a prolific petty criminal. He was a drug addict and I think that's what led to most of his offences. He needed the money for drugs. A pretty nondescript kind of a criminal, career criminal. He was only 24 years of age. He'd been in prison before. He'd been in prison certainly for uh, a crime where he'd pushed an 82-year-old over and broken a hip while in the process of robbing her. It's not uncommon for very serious violent offenders to have a history of offending. Some offenders can get used to the buzz that they experience from moderately serious crimes. In this way, they can be drawn to more serious crimes and violence can escalate. Not only is the DNA a match to Michael Hardacre, forensics are also able to place him at the scene of the Barron Street attack. We got his prints in the palm print against the palm print that had been recovered by the Forensic Science Service at the Barron Street, and it was a match. With clear forensic links to both attacks, police waste no time arresting him on the 26th of September when they make a dawn raid. Very, very quickly, Hardacre was brought into custody. It was a, an unbelievable feeling when he was actually identified as an offender and, and brought in. I saw him in the custody area not long after he'd been arrested. And again, that's one of those things that sticks in my mind. You match up the name, you match up the face to these horrific crimes. And initially, I think I just looked at him and thought, how on earth could you do it? And he, he looked normal. I was expecting a monster in my own mind, but he looked normal. You could almost visibly, physically feel, see the relief in the Rochdale area where people now knew that they had nothing to fear when they went out at night. But for Eileen's family, there is no relief. 
I still had nothing to connect that individual to the scene of Eileen's murder. And I still get emotional about it because you're dealing with real people. Investigators are no closer to proving that the serial attacker Hardacre had anything to do with her murder. We're feeling under pressure to, to, to try and find that little bit of that chink of evidence. In Rochdale, detectives are investigating the murder of 65-year-old Eileen Yavchak. She was sexually assaulted and strangled with her tights, and a distinctive mark on her face indicates she had been stamped on by her attacker. CSIs have fibre tapings of a red fleece from her body, but have nothing to match them to. 24-year-old Michael Hardacre has been arrested on suspicion of two violent attacks, one at a canal towpath, the other in the town centre. Both victims claim he told them not to look at him. From the towpath attack, there's seminal fluid that links our offender to that attack. From the attack in Rochdale Town Centre, there's his palm print. There's great evidence from these two scenes, incriminating evidence to be able to tie Hardacre to the two sexual assaults. A footprint has also been recovered, and detectives are now looking for a size 10 Nike trainer. The three incidents have taken place within months of each other, but the police cannot link the two attacks to Eileen's murder. With Hardacre in custody, police now need to build the case against him. Once an offender is identified and arrested, it then becomes really important for a full examination to be done of his home address. CSIs would be looking for items of red clothing, it's Nike trainers, it's any bloodstained clothing. If any of these items are found, this obviously adds weight to the case. The forensic search of the premises found the victim from Baron Street's blood on the washing machine. So he had obviously come back heavily soaked in blood. This obviously is good corroborative evidence to say um, this offender has been in close proximity to this victim when they've been bleeding. When asked about the Baron Street and Canal towpath attacks, Hardacre denies everything. I remember the police saying to him in his interview, there's only one person that you're concerned about, that's yourself. And I'm sure that was true. The guy was um, a psychopath, as we later came to, to find out. Psychopathy is characterised by a lack of remorse, a distinct callousness, uh, a lack of care or worry or regard for other people, so subdued emotional behaviour. While Hardacre is being interviewed, a major development takes place. One of his relatives was so appalled by what had happened that he handed in Hardacre's clothing at the police station. The person who came in said, is Michael Hardacre still in custody? You better have a look at these. And he just put this bag on the counter and just walked out. In the bag were a pair of heavily blood-soaked training shoes. A size 10 Nike trainer. Um, quite a well-wornish sole on it, had been well-walked. The trainers are rushed to the lab, where forensics compare them with the cast taken from the Baron Street crime scene. It's obvious, almost instantly, that the impression from the sole of this shoe is going to match. The forensic scientists may well be able to say that shoe made that footwear mark, but then we need to be able to put the offender in that shoe. Nevertheless, police have enough to charge Hardacre for both attacks and he's put on remand in Strangeways prison. But there's no forensic evidence to link him at the moment to the murder of Eileen. As the Baron Street and Canal Towpath investigations wind down, Michael Freeman and his team working on Eileen's murder are stuck. We were sat around in our murder investigation room and we were still saying, well, look, you know, it's likely that this person is responsible for our murder, but where is the connection? Then we focused on what we call evidence of similar fact. So what did he say to the girl on the canal bank that he raped? Don't look at me, don't look at me. Count to 200. If you look at me, I'll, I'll, I'll cut you. What did he say to the, to the girl at Baron Street? Don't look at me, don't look at me. If you look at me, I'll cut you, which he did anyway. I've done worse than this. I can remember the senior investigating officer because he carried a magnifying glass 
Uh, it was a bit of a laughing point. He'd gone home, he'd examined the photographs of Eileen's body with his magnifying glass, and he, he saw that her eyes had been cut. There was a, a nick in the corner of each eye near the cornea. And he showed it to me, and I have to say, when I looked and looked closely like he was doing, I had to agree. Senior investigators approach Eileen's family for permission to perform a second post-mortem. And sure enough, they had been cut right across with a craft knife. Police suspect that the offender cut Eileen's eyelids because she didn't listen to the offender's instructions. This demonstrates a severe level of brutality. We know that Eileen was quite deaf and that she didn't really like wearing hearing aids. And maybe if she didn't understand what was being said to her, whatever, and that could have contributed to the level of, uh, uh, of the ferociousness of, of, of the attack that she, she endured. It's a strong hypothesis and a similar MO, but police need forensic evidence to put Hardacre at the scene of Eileen's murder. He's currently on remand for two serious attacks, which he denies, and his trial date is fast approaching. We were in danger of there being a trial going ahead, and this took an immense amount of liaison with the Crown Prosecution Service to say, look, we really need to connect all three. Forensic scientists assigned to Eileen's case examine the items handed in by Hardacre's relative, which tied him to the Barron Street attack. Together with the shoes, an item of clothing was handed in to the police at Rochdale. This item of clothing was a red fleece. Going back to the attack on Eileen, a forensic scientist had identified that there was some foreign red fibres on Eileen's body. What we knew was, from speaking to his girlfriend, that Michael was in the habit of wearing a, a snide Tommy Hilfiger uh, top that she had bought him for £15 off Rochdale Market. And witnesses would say to us, he wore it as a second skin. This could potentially be a breakthrough moment in order to tie a red item of clothing, a red fleece, to the murder of Eileen. Forensic scientists compare fibres from the red fleece to the fibre tapings taken from Eileen's body. So fibre evidence is done by the human eye and the red fibres from the fleece match the fibres on Eileen's clothing. This is incriminating evidence to be able to tie Hardacre to the murder of Eileen. Without the fibres, we wouldn't have been able to connect Michael Hardacre to the scene of Eileen Yashat's murder. Absolutely top-class work, that. You know, the Tommy Hilfiger jackets, obviously, but it just looked extremely unlikely that all these factors together could be more than one person. It's yet more highly compelling evidence, but the CPS needs more to make the case watertight. In the hope of securing a confession, police put this to Hardacre, but he calmly denies it. He certainly wasn't prepared to admit to the murder, even though the evidence was presented to him in terms of the fibres. Knowing that Hardacre's defence will argue that someone else could have murdered Eileen while wearing a similar fleece, investigators are under pressure to find even more robust forensic evidence. We had to put pieces together at that stage. I can remember vividly one of the detectives who worked in the incident room as exhibits officer had been thumbing through photographs of his footwear and she actually quite cleverly in my mind matched up one of his training shoe patterns to the mark on Eileen's face. If a pair of shoes had been recovered from the suspect these could be potentially linked back to the footwear mark on the victim's face. A forensic scientist would be able to identify whether this is a match by matching up the photograph of the footwear impression on her face with the actual shoe. And so I remember taking the impression down to Guy's Hospital in London. At the Department of Forensic Medicine in Guy's Hospital, Chief Scientific Officer Derek Tremaine has developed the National Injuries Database. The Injuries Database was created initially for a teaching aid, but it became a, a, a sort of a, a referral service. By adding lots of data on, um, we can compare uh, certain injuries. It's not only 
uh, bruising, stab wounds, shootings, anything. He's a forensic imaging scientist with over 20 years experience identifying pattern markings on skin. It's fairly common to find footwear marks on skin because it produces a thing called intradermal bruising. This is where blood gets displaced um, outwards uh, from underneath the tread mark, for instance, and will displace into the grooves, showing a pattern. If someone's still alive, after a few days or so, that would completely disappear. When someone's dead, there's no circulation in the body, so it will remain there. Derek has developed specialist technology to map and identify bodily injuries. They brought us the photographs, and um, Eileen had a um, patterned injury on her left cheek, and I recognise this as a footwear mark. It was suspected of being a Nike trainer. On a computer software, we would overlay, using layers, the image of the trainer over Eileen's injury. He had on a piece of paper an impression of the footwear and a piece of acetate which he laid over the top of the impression on Eileen's face and it fitted like a fingerprint impression. It was brilliant. In this instance, it was a shaped injury on the face and a part of the heel of a trainer. Being able to link the footwear mark on the pair of shoes to the injury on Eileen's face is incriminating evidence to be able to tie Hardacre to the murder of Eileen. What that meant to the, the investigation into the murder of Eileen was everything really. When I made the phone call back to Rochdale and told the incident room what we'd got, I could hear the cheering in the background. It was brilliant because we now had the guy bang to rights. I would imagine that if he hadn't been caught when he was, he would have struck again. But in spite of the overwhelming evidence, Hardacre continues to deny every charge levelled at him, forcing the CPS and police into a high-profile trial, which will require his vulnerable victims to testify. In Rochdale, detectives are investigating the murder of 65-year-old Eileen Yavchak. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled with her own tights. Forensics have been instrumental in charging Michael Hardacre for the crime, along with two other violent attacks in the area. But he is claiming to be innocent. He certainly wasn't prepared to admit to the murder, and... Um... He certainly wasn't ever going to admit to, to cutting her eyes either. Um, so we knew um, that we would be facing a uh, trial. Hardacre stands trial at Manchester Crown Court, where he enters a plea of not guilty. Alistair Webster is prosecuting the high-profile case. There's always a lot at stake. Uh, in a murder case, self-evidently, press gallery is absolutely full where the camera's outside. It's really important that you tell a clear story um, that reflects the serious nature of the case. And I feel a real responsibility to the victims' families. And so if the police have spent a huge amount of time and skill putting the case together, I feel obviously a, a very heavy responsibility of making sure the case is presented properly. The survivors from the Barron Street and Canal Towpath attacks are called to give evidence. The victims having to go through the whole thing again and relive it is very difficult, but ultimately there's no other way around. If you have to prove the case, you've got to prove the case. To go into court, to face him in court and to give evidence must have been one of the hardest things they've ever had to do in their lives. But they did it. And they did it convincingly as well. And the, the fortitude that they showed, the bravery that they showed, in doing that speaks volumes to me. The families of the victims were there and it's extremely distressing for them. I mean, post-mortem is bad enough. I mean, you think the circumstances of Eileen died and, you know, a lonely death, not far from her home, um, subjected to a horrible, violent, a sexual assault. 
you can't help but be affected by that and it's for, for, for the members of the family it really is quite appalling and they all acted with complete dignity not only is it a distressing trial for the witnesses and family it's also distressing for the jury jurors who aren't inured to this sort of thing as we tend to be because we deal with it so often uh, will find these cases very very difficult and very emotional and some people frank frankly try and succeed in saying that I just don't think I can cope with this case. It requires fortitude. Just as we ask a lot of the victims' families, we ask a lot of jurors to sit through hearing this horrendous evidence of things well outside their experience and be asked to judge fellow human beings who have acted in a way that's hard to describe as human, frankly. After a two-week-long trial, the jury is sent out to consider its verdict. The jury took three hours or so to convict him unanimously of all the offences uh, and so that really shows a fairly strong case. And what pleased me more than anything else was that the judge then decided to sentence him on every single charge and I think that's really important actually because every victim got a result and knew he was going to prison for that amount of time for them, that amount of time for them, that amount of time for them. The judge sentences Hardacre to a total of 146 years in prison, with a minimum 22 years for Eileen's murder. But during sentencing, he is unmoved. He was just totally defiant. That There was no hint of regret, empathy or anything. And he was busy to shout defiance and obscenity at the victim's family as he was taken down the stairs. It, it was a chilling moment, I thought. He was just about the most dangerous person I've, I've come across because of that complete lack of empathy, guilt. Hardacre's conviction is a huge relief for Eileen's family and the victims of his violent crimes. I hope that the process of bringing him to justice made them feel that the system had worked and that there was some sort of what can the right word be? Some sort of closure for them, or at least it might begin to help a healing process which probably will last the rest of their lives. It's also a triumph for the investigation teams and their colleagues in forensics. This is a really good example of crime scene coordination. The fact that you've had three different crime scenes over a period of time and they were able to link the scenes together through forensic evidence, and not only that, but get an offender for all counts on all charges with a total of 146 years to be served in prison. The forensic aspect of this case was everything really, because when you strip away the, the forensic evidence, we were left with very little. Without the forensic evidence in this case, I think it's highly unlikely that there'd have been uh, enough to convict Michael Hardacre because the DNA evidence connecting him with the first case, very difficult to refute if you're a defendant. The fingerprint and the blood connecting him with the final case, very difficult to refute. And the combination of the footprint and the fibres in Eileen Jorchuk's murder, again, very difficult to talk away and explain. And when you add them all together, whatever explanation you might try and come up for one, it's very difficult to explain one after the other after the other. But for DCI Freeman and his team, the investigation leaves a lasting impression. I still get quite emotional talking about Eileen's murder, that rape and attempt murder at Barron Street. Because, you know, I spent eight, nine months investigating Eileen's murder and it's with you every bit of the day. And it affects not just you, you take your home, affects your family. I think my wife would say that I was probably a different person for eight months. I've got memories of it that, that were shocking, that were absolutely shocking, even to seasoned detectives who were working on this kind of case all the time. It, it was harrowing um, and you would go home at the end of the day having seen something that would stick, stick in your mind forever. Sometimes we get people saying to us, you must be really hard, we're not. And these things struck home and, and stayed 